Okay, I'm just trying to make sure we get everybody in that's in the waiting room. Um, we'll go ahead and get started today. Thank you all for being on this Zoom call with us. Um, as, as with everyone's business, we've had to pivot and do things differently. And any of you that are regularly involved in Chamber, you know we are face-to-face -face and we, we like our events. So this is a big change for us, uh, but I appreciate you uh, joining us today. Uh, we're very excited to have Chris with us. Um, just before I turn it over to Eva, who is our legislative chair with the Chamber, I wanna mention a few things that are going on with the Chamber that if you may not know about. Uh, we've started a Facebook group page to help support our local restaurants. Um, that group is called Rockwell Takeout and Delivery Options. Right now we have over 10,000 folks in there with over 100 restaurants regularly posting and offering great specials uh, to our community. So I encourage you to support that. We also started a gift card rally last Friday. Um, generous thanks to our sponsor, uh, Independent Financial, who's been adding on an extra $10 to each gift card. Uh, so we sold about $2,500 worth of those uh, gift cards to our local restaurants um, since last Friday. So I hope you'll pop on there and um, take advantage of a great deal and be able to support them as well. You'll start to see um, many more programs like this. Um, happening with our chamber as we continue to be in our stay in place order. Um, we know it's critical that we're keeping up with you all and you're able to keep up with us. Um, we'll, we'll host educational um, seminars such as this, but we also have networking events uh, through Zoom as well. We have one tomorrow from 5 to 6 p.m. Uh, that's taking the place of our normal event that happens at the Hilton every week. Uh, so you're encouraged to join us for that. Um, even if you're not a chamber partner, we have pushed that out to our community um, at large. Um, any business, any person doing business in the Rockwall community needs our services right now, and we are happy to be here uh, for them. So if you know someone that's not a chamber partner and you wanna encourage them to hop on that call tomorrow, um, you can go to our Facebook page to register and or our website. We'll keep both of those spots updated for you. Uh, so that you can stay abreast of what we have going on. Uh, we're in the process of planning several different Zoom events for you all. Um, but thank you again for joining us today. I want to introduce Eva Hummel. Um, Eva is on our executive committee with the Rockwell Area Chamber, and she is our legislative chair. Thought it was very important to include her in today's conversation as this being one of the biggest pieces of legislation that we have seen or will see in probably quite some time. So I will turn it over to Eva today. Well, good afternoon, everybody. As Darby said, I'm Eva Humble with Atmos Energy, and it really is my honor to be able to be here with you all today um, as we have a great uh, speaker lined up um, just to share some information on the Federal CARES Act, major provisions, implementation, and resources. The main thing to know is that this is continuously evolving and we're getting updates every day. But today, we're going to get the latest and greatest from Chris. So to tell you a little bit about Chris, Chris Denzel is Senior Director for International Policy in the International Division of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and is responsible for promoting Chamber's international trade and investment agenda. I want to thank Chris for taking time out of his uh, day to uh, give us some important information around the Federal CARES Act. There's so much out there. There's so much that we don't know, and we're hoping that today uh, we will simplify things a little bit for, uh, for you and provide resources for you so that you can get those answers that you need. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Chris. David Darby, thank you so much. And thanks everyone for joining the call today. Uh, you know, like Ava mentioned, this is a rapidly evolving situation. Um, we're getting new guidance coming out uh, pretty much almost every day from the SBA, Small Business Administration, from Treasury as they work to implement um, the CARES Act. So this is, uh, hopefully I, I do have the most accurate up-to-date information uh, at the moment. Certainly always check the government websites uh, for the latest interim rules, final rules that are coming out. Uh, the Chamber's also put together a number of uh, guides and publications as well um, that we are constantly updating as, you know, as, as the situation evolves. Um, you know, just over this weekend, we saw, you know, new guidance come out. Uh, and then, you know, I'm sure you all read the stories or if you were applying for one of these loans yesterday, uh, the entire system went down, the E-Trans system. Uh, was crashed. So uh, this is, this is uh, it's, a, it's a very fast moving target. Um, but hopefully what I'm able to do today is just kind of outline what was in the bill, uh, those big provisions for you, um, you know, 
you right off the bat, I, I'm not a, I'm not a lender. I'm not an accountant. I know all your circumstances are different. So I encourage you to talk with your folks uh, about what makes sense for you. So we'll talk about the interplay between some of the big programs today. Uh, happy to chat about, you know, what could be on the horizon. There was some news that uh, the Senate this week, just this week is possibly Thursday or Friday going to look at trying to put additional funds uh, into this protect, paycheck protection program, which is, you know, really the hallmark of the, of the, uh, of the, uh, of the CARES Act. So um, I think that kind of speaks to um, the need that's out there. I think that speaks to, to the wants uh, of the business community to get some of these, these loans processed and, and on the books. So um, with that, are, are we going to be using the slides here? You just want me to kind of uh, just to talk here. I don't know. I can't see the slides. Awesome. Awesome, awesome. Could we go to that, uh, the next slide, please? All right, so here's, here's the overview. Um, and what I was talking about, um, you know, I never mentioned this is a massive package, $2.2 .2 trillion. Um, so it was called the CARES Act. Um, this is the largest economic stimulus package our country has ever passed. Um, we will see if there will be, you know, an even bigger one down the road here. There's a lot of discussion about, well, A, we need to replenish some of the funds. Uh, some folks are also talking about trying to do infrastructure as part of a, a, a next package. So it's going to be interesting to see um, where this heads. So this is the third uh, bill uh, in a series of coronavirus related measures uh, that Congress has passed and the president has signed into law. And really what this is, this is, this is uh, meant to be that bridge um, that carries, uh, carries us through the next couple of months to you know, you know, prevent a long downturn or a prolonged recession. Um, you know, so we get back to a place where we can resume business, get get some of the, the orders lifted on the shelter in place. Um, but, you know, really just to provide that immediate assistance, which is, you know, why this was such a quick turnaround. Uh, you know, Congress, uh, you know, pretty much put this bill together uh, faster than I've ever seen anything put together. You know, it was, it was signed the next day by the president and, and the first programs were rolled out a week later. So this this has really been an expedient exercise in so far as Congress goes. Uh, and I think I'm allowed to say that because I worked on the Hill for a number of years, but uh, it's typically a slow moving animal over there, but they really, they really put their heart behind this one. So as I mentioned, $2.2 .2 trillion, there's additional funds that can be leveraged by the treasury. And we're starting to see some of those come online. Um, and that can be an additional 4 trillion in support. And we can talk a little bit more uh, about those later. Um, you know, first right out the gate, um, these individual, um, the individual provisions of the bill, uh, these are the direct payments. Um, so these are, these are the checks from the treasury. Uh, if you take a look at it, it's 1200 per individual, 24 if you file uh, a joint return and then 500 um, for each additional child. And this begins to get phased out uh, after 75K income for an individual filer and uh, uh, 150,000 for um, joint filers. And the other thing, you know, kind of just quickly on the, on the um, individual side for this bill, uh, was the bill did expand unemployment insurance. So it provides, uh, the federal government's gonna provide an additional $600 uh, on top of the regular state benefit through July 31st. Uh, and all states have to do to qualify for this is to have um, the governor accept these additional benefits. And we've been receiving a lot of questions, and I actually saw this was a, a portion of a Wall Street Journal op-ed this morning about this benefit and, and would this incentivize folks um, to stay on unemployment for you know longer than I guess they otherwise normally would. but uh, it's important to remember that this, while this is an enhanced benefit, uh, the eligibility ends when an individual can return to work. Uh, so if an employer, you know, reopens, for example, and, and starts calling employees back and that, that individual is available to work, but they choose not to, uh, then the uh, individual ability, uh, the individual eligibility uh, ends. Could we go to the next slide, please? All right, so here, major provisions for employers. This is where we'll spend our time. I'll talk about what's available to all employers. I'll talk about what's available to medium uh, and larger employers. Uh, and then that bottom part right down there, that's where we'll spend the bulk of our time talking about the provisions that were put into place for small businesses, the self-employed, independent contractors, uh, and nonprofits. And then we'll wrap it up by actually going back to the second coronavirus bill. And we'll talk a little bit about the paid sick uh, and the uh, Federal, Man Federal, Federal Medi <laughs> uh, Family Medical Leave Act, FMLA. Uh, we'll talk about some of those provisions um, from the second coronavirus bill, the phase two bill, um, because they do obviously impact uh, you all as employers. Uh, could we go to the next slide, please? Okay, so for all employers um, on the payroll tax front, right? So obviously, you know, there's the portion that uh, you as employers uh, pay the federal government. There's also the, the wages that are taken from 
um, the employee. And so under this bill, uh, an employer, importantly, an employer can choose to delay their payment uh, of the portion of the payroll tax, right? The 6.2 Social Security. Um, they can delay that, you know, between now and January uh, 1st of 2021, next year. So if they choose this delay, uh, they have to pay 50% of the accumulated amounts that they would have owed December 31st uh, of, the, of next year, right, 2021, and then the remaining the following year, December 30, 31, 2022. Um, but there's an important caveat here. So this is generally available to all employers, except if you have a loan forgiven under the Paycheck Protection Program, which is what we're gonna spend most of our time talking about later today. Um, so just keep that in the back of the mind. Um, some other tax changes that were made, the NOL is your net operating losses. So if you have a business that did have uh, an operating loss and you, want, and you want to be able to use that against your prior taxes paid, um, now operating losses can be expanded back to 2018, 2019, 2020, and can generally be carried back about five years. Um, this applies to pass-throughs and sole proprietors. Um, and then if you're a business, you know, we could talk about AMTs, the alternative minimum tax if you want, um, but I'm not going to touch on that um, right now. Uh, there's also some interest deductibility provisions here, uh, and this is uh, one provision that I think has been getting a little bit more attention, um, but this was expanded out uh, for, you know, most importantly for restaurants and retail establishments that made improvements over the past couple of years. Uh, they can now accelerate the recovery uh, of that. Um, and, you know, these provisions, right, are, are all about one thing. They're about uh, improving liquidity. Um, for employers, right? This is not this is not so much about reducing reducing the overall tax burden as it is just trying to uh, accelerate the recovery of some of these uh, investments, but also just make sure that uh, employers have more liquidity moving forward. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Okay. So the other uh, big provision that's available to all employers this is employee retention credit, um, and this was a very late addition to the bill. It wasn't in the original draft, so it hasn't really received that much of an uh, attention. Um, so maybe I'll spend a few seconds talking about it here. And we have a guide up on our website um, that walks through this as well. So this retention credit is generally available to all employers. So we're talking about businesses, but also nonprofits um, who are partially uh, or fully, uh, fully shut down as a result of the coronavirus, or they have a 50% drop in their gross receipts in a quarter. So they're eligible for this until those gross receipts get back up to 80% of years, uh, prior years amounts. Um, so this is, this is obviously designed for folks that are shut down but continue to pay um, their employees. So how much is, is the credit worth? It's 50% of wages paid by the employer up to, to $10,000 per, per employee, and that's a fully refundable tax credit. So think about it as about a $5,000 tax credit available to the employer. Now there are special rules here um, for employers uh, with more than 100 folks and, and, and those with less than 100 folks. So. Um, if you have more than 100 employees, um, the benefit only applies to the employees who you are paying but not providing services. Um, so these are going to be your, your folks, for example, that um, are unable to telework. And if you have less than 100 employees, um, that requirement that they uh, not be providing services doesn't apply. It's available to all employees you pay during the eligible pay period. Um, and that eligible pay period is when you're shut down or when you have a quarter with that uh, drop in gross receipts that I was talking about earlier. Um, so much like you know, we were talking about earlier the interaction between some of these programs. Uh, it's important to note here, um, you know, the Paycheck Protection Program, the one we're going to talk about later. If you receive one of these loans, the Paycheck Protection um, Loan, which is by design meant to be the most favorable in the CARES Act, um, you can't take advantage of this em employee retention credit. So when I talk about, you know, the, circum the, the varying circumstances of each business, um, this is really where folks need to do their homework. And um, I was talking to my father, who's a CPA, and, and also... Uh, the CEO of a small business uh, back home in Illinois, and, and we were walking through this. And there's there's some there's some intricacies, so I, that's why I encourage folks to to really take time and and study the additional guidance that's coming out, just to make sure they understand. Um, you know, there are a couple of either or situations here, so we just want to make sure that we have all those covered. Um, Dr. we go to the next slide, please? Uh, so mid and large size size employers. Um, you know, this certainly garnered a lot of attention in the press as this was being considered. So, you know, as you can see, it's four, four five, four billion uh, made available by, by the Treasury Department for loan, loan guarantees, um, and to support Federal Reserve credit uh, facilities, which is uh, one thing that we're talking about now uh, as part of the, the small business lending program, right, that grant program, the Paycheck Protection Program, the Fed is looking at taking some of those loans off, off uh, the national and the local lenders that way they have uh, additional resources uh, to make new loans under the PPP program. Um, 
So that 454 is directly available for small business. I expect we'll see additional guidance coming out on this, especially as it relates to the Federal Reserve, because there's a lot that they can leverage here. Um, and these were some maneuvers, actions that were taken most robustly uh, in 2008 after the financial crisis um, as well. And there's certainly restrictions um, you know, that go along with you know, taking these loan or loan guarantees you know, this is where we start talking about the prohibition on stock buybacks. This is where we start talking about the limits on executive compensation. Um, but this is not where I'm gonna spend most of my time. We're gonna head to the next slide so we can talk about the small business provisions. Thank you. All right, so small business, the Paytech Protection Program, right? So this is, this is really, you know, what was meant to be the hallmark, the focus, the focal point of the bill. Uh, and this is for small businesses, the self-employed, independent contractors, uh, and nonprofits. Um, so this is about 350 billion. Uh, it is first come first serve, which is why Congress is already having conversations about uh, replenishing the fund. And I think we'll see, uh, at least according to Leader McConnell, we'll see some action on that later this week uh, about trying to replenish this fund because there has been pretty good demand even with um, the issues and applying for the grants and getting them approved. Um, you know, last week on Friday, this opened up for the small businesses. And then uh, I believe on this Friday is when it opened up for the independent contractors. Um, and others. And there's been, you know, if you follow the news or if anyone's actually, you know, gone to their lender and applied for one of these, I'd love to hear uh, about your experience. But um, there's different numbers of how many have been applied for, how many have been approved and the like. Um, but I guess kind of a general way of thinking about this, if you generally qualify for an SBA loan, right, if you're, if you're pre-qualified or you used them in the past, you're going to qualify under this program. Uh, and in addition to this, there's some businesses um, that normally wouldn't apply or normally wouldn't uh, be eligible for SBA, i.e. Uh, the independent contractors and the self-employed that will be qualified under this program. Um, there's also uh, a provision dealing with, uh, especially kind of looking at restaurant and hotel folks. Um, so this is calculated on a per location basis, uh, you know, because typically if you add up all the locations, for example, and you have more than 500 employees, you know, you would be prohibited from using this, but under this bill, um, they're gonna judge folks on a per location basis. So if you haven't qualified for an SBA program or loan in the past uh, because of this, uh, you should be eligible now under the Paytech, Paycheck Protection Program. Um, so how much can you borrow? Uh, so if you look at the slide, the, the middle bullets there, uh, you can borrow up to two and a half months of your average payroll expenses. Um, there's a formula to calculate this, the average monthly payroll. Uh, and then what's that calculated? You multiply that by two and a half, except the loan can't exceed 10 million. And, and one of the resources, one of the, the most widely shared used resources that we have is a four page document, a four page guide um, that breaks out, you know, who's eligible, what can you count in this calculation? Uh, how do you do this calculation? Um, but then lenders will also have additional supplemental information on this because uh, we'll, touch about, we'll touch on this a little later, but there have been some changes made to the program. Um, so where do you get these loans? You don't go to the SBA. You don't go to the Treasury Department, obviously. We expect folks uh, are going to go to their national lenders and their local lenders. Uh, and if you already have a local lender that's SBA Section 7A approved, um, they already participate in this program. Um, you know, it's our understanding that, you know, the congressional intent and certainly the administration intent uh, is to have as many, many, as many lenders as possible. Um, so they made the terms very generous, not only uh, for folks to get this to keep people on payroll, um, but then also, um, you know, for lenders to uh, be dispersing and, and approving these loans um, pretty quickly. The, I was reading one, one part where the SBA mentioned that they had already, you know, activated an additional 30,000 lenders or something along, the, along those lines. And um, if you go to the Small Business Administration website, uh, one of the bottom links is, is, uh, is a um, lender uh, locator tool um, where you can plug in your zip code and figure out who these. So there, there are um, very minimal uh, requirements as, 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 as it goes for underwriting these loans. No collateral required, no personal guarantee is required. Uh, and the really unique feature about this is that the loans convert to grants uh, based off what the borrower spends the money on. Um, you know, so really the way that, you know, to look at this is look at eight weeks of your expenses after the date of the origination of your loan, and you get to tally everything up that you would have normally spent, um, you know, on payroll, uh, rent, interest on mortgage, utilities, other qualified expenses. Uh, and you get to take that and you get to take that loan and it will be forgiven as long as you, uh, the employer, retain your worker or rehire them uh, when you reopen for business. Uh, and obviously, you know, the forgiveness can't exceed the total amount that you actually um, borrowed here. Uh, there are some in important um, conditions. Um, so your loan 
forgiveness will be reduced proportionally if you reduce the number of full-time employees or equivalents that you have uh, relative to your benchmark period. Uh, and that's either the year before or the first two months uh, of this year. Uh, and that's also, there's also a phase out here. Um, you can't you know, claim any wages over $100,000 for an employee. There is a cap on that. Um, and that's really what this was designed for, right? Um, going after um, you know, your middle income earners. And um, you know, employers can also uh, avoid a reduction in the forgiveness um, you know, because we know that there were folks that had to lay people off. Well, the good news is if you bring people back, restore their wages, and uh, you know, maintain them on the payrolls through, Jan through June 30th of this year, then you're eligible um, for this. And you know, really bottom line, what this is all about uh, is helping businesses keep people on their payrolls. We get asked um, you know, about, well, what if you know, I'm deemed non-essential or I'm in an area where you know, state or local guidance doesn't allow me from opening. And, and you know, for the purposes of this loan, the PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program, um, it's really just asking, are you paying your employees? Um, and remember, I mean, obviously the goal of this, this entire exercise was to keep all, all sorts of business, particularly small business, um, from shuttering. Um, you know, so as I mentioned, there have been, um, there have been a few changes made to the program. Uh, originally the interest rate was uh, half a percent. That was now at 1%. Uh, and if you lock it in today, that'll be your set rate. The, the PPP loans mature after two years. Uh, and this one is, I think the one that's probably getting the most attention. I don't have any bullets on this, I apologize, but um, you know, business owners require to use 75% of their loans on payroll, um, which obviously reduces how much you can use on things like the mortgage, the rent, the utility, um, utility payments and other qualified business expenses. So um, really talk with your lenders about this, make sure that you understand the parameters, but you know, really at the end of the day uh, on this one, the goal is to have folks apply in the morning, uh, and be approved at night. And obviously there's, right now there is a delta, a delta between how many people can apply, how many lenders are actually part of this program, and then how many um, you know, dollars have actually gone out the door. Um, so can go to the next slide, please. Uh, Chris, this yes. is, uh, before um, we go to the next slide, um, I, I do wanna let all of the uh, people that are in the webinar know that if you have a question, please uh, present it through the chat and we will ask and Chris, we do have one right now that I would like um, to just ask on behalf of one of our attendees. And it is for employers with more than 100 employees, what is the qualifications to determine whether a credit can be taken? Which credit are we talking about here? I'm thinking the $5,000 tax credit. Uh, the employee retention credit. Is that the one that we're looking at? In the notes here, it says a five, the 5,000 tax credit. Um, let's see. Yes, it's the five, um, she said. What is the qualification? Um, so, so with, sorry, let me just read this one more time. With more than 100 employees. So this is where it starts to get into um, the question of, you know, if you have folks um, that are not working or they're teleworking, right? So the requirement is, you know, if you have, um, if you have more than 100 employees, what I think about this is the benefit applies only to those employees who you are paying but are not providing services. So if you are paying folks but they're teleworking, that doesn't count um, toward the calculation towards the credit. Uh, where is the finder located? I'll try and pull up the link, but I believe it was either, I, I remember that both the Small Business Administration and the Treasury um, websites like treasury.gov both have COVID-19 landing pages. Uh, and the bottom bullet point was, um, whatchamacallit, find, find a local lender. But if there's already someone that you use, as I mentioned, uh, for the pay pay tech, Paycheck Protection Program, uh, if you already use an SBA Section 7A lender, they're automatically qualified. And then also your big national lenders, think JP, JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, BOA are also participating in the programs, um, but some of them have varying eligibility requirements, at least right now. Thank you, Stacy. I appreciate that. Stacy posted the link. Um, how does someone who is self-employed and or independent contractor allocate 75% of the funds to employee as they do not have uh, employees? That's a good question. I'll have to get back on that one just because that part of the program hasn't come online, so I really haven't spent that much time into it. Um, 
but I will take a peek at that, uh, James, and I will make a note to get back to Darby and Ava on that for you. Uh, and that was the second question with Rachel. Um, okay. All right, let, we'll, um, okay, make, I'll make a note here to get back to James. Um, all right, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, all right, so here's the guide that I mentioned earlier. Um, to learn more about it, uh, chamber.com slash SB loans. Uh, we also have the small business program co that's always putting out more content. Um, I think at least, you know, the last two weeks, uh, Neil Bradley, our chief policy officer, uh, in conjunction with Inc have also done a national small business town hall, uh, as well, where they're also providing the latest updates, providing answers to questions that, um, small businesses, independent contractors, self-employed, uh, have also been asking about as well. Um, so we'll go to the next slide, please. All right, SBA economic injury disaster loans. These are your idle loans. Um, so if you're familiar, you know, if God forbid you ever had to apply for one of these, these are the loans that you get after a hurricane or a tornado or a flood or something like that. Uh, and this does benefit small, small businesses, self-employed, independent contractors and the like. We'll talk about the interplay with the uh, paycheck, paycheck Protection Program here uh, in a second. So who's eligible? Um, so these are small businesses, nonprofits, including faith-based. Um, no restrictions here on the type of nonprofit. Um, you know, it, 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 if uh, it's an entity that a nonprofit has fewer than 500 employees, again, here, sole proprietors, and independent contractors count as well. So this is an actual loan. This is not a loan that converts to a grant like the previous program that we just discussed. Uh, you can borrow up to $2 million in working capital that's repaid over 30 years. Um, I think the interest rate was 375, and I believe that's still generally applicable. Um, if you take out this loan, payments are deferred up to a year, so you don't have to immediately restart paying this loan. Um, so they did make it easier for businesses to apply. Uh, the loans can be based on credit scores. Uh, you don't have to immediately produce tax returns. You can get up to $200,000 without a personal guarantee uh, and no collateral required for $25,000 or less. Beyond that, there's general security interest. Um, sometimes it's secured with real estate, but they're gonna try and move uh, away from using real estate. Um, in this particular instance for this for this um, for this loan, um, so an important feature here uh, that's brand new for Idle Loan as a result of the CARES Act. So if you're applying for one of these injury disaster loans, uh, you can request to be provided with an emergency grant, and this emergency grant uh, has to be paid within three days, uh, and it's up to ten thousand um, dollars. The bill and you know our uh, online guide um, details what you can use this for, um, but generally. Um, these do not have to be repaid if you are eventually denied a loan. So if you apply for an idle loan, but then you also apply uh, to get the 10,000 upfront, um, but you're denied that loan, uh, you don't have to um, give back the $10,000. Uh, so as I mentioned, there are some important interactions here uh, with the Paycheck Protection Program that we just talked about. Um, so for example, if you end up with both, and you would generally end up with both because you already applied for an idle loan before you went ahead uh, and looked at the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, but you um, you can roll those for together, but you can't get double forgiveness on the 10,000 um, emergency uh, part of the EIDL loan um, off of the Paycheck Protection um, Forgiveness, right? So that program has the forgiveness that we talked about. You can't get that. Um, so uh, really what we're looking at um, here is, you know, how do these two programs interact? Um, you can stack them, you just can't double dip. Um, so where do you go, to get, where do you go uh, to get these loans? These are through the SBA, right? The Small Business Administration itself, so sba.gov. Um, this is the loan that uh, chambers and other, you know, local chambers and other 501c6s can apply for. Uh, there has been some heartache there. Uh, with these loans being United Chambers, something we're working on, something that we're pushing a, a little further on. Um, so I, Darby, I'll get you some more information if that's something um, that you're interested in. Uh, could we go to the next slide, please? Chris, oh. um, let me just, um, if I may, there's been a couple of other questions. And one of them is if we are self-employed with no employees and applied through the SBA.gov, should we keep waiting for a reply? It's been a couple of weeks. So. Applied for the idle loan? Yeah. Um, how do we follow up on idle loans? Um, boy, that's a good question. I haven't faced that one yet. I'm at the, I'm at the get back to you on that one. Okay, and we had the same question um, with another one of our attendees also. So if we can, we can find out about that. And then 
$10,000 grant that you, the $10,000 grant, is it up to $10,000 just depending on what that individual's application looks right. like? So yeah. it could be 1,000 or up I to believe so, yeah. And that, and that 10,000 really is just to, like I said, that is, um, that is the emergency aspect of it, right? To get out the door faster. But, um, you know, I think, you know, as, as I mentioned, folks are, are, are really wanting people to use the paycheck, pay tech protection program, right? Because it has higher caps. It's about keeping employees, but I understand for uh, the self-employed and for ICs uh, that this might make most more sense. But let me get back to you on that question about um, those, uh, you know, not hearing back when you already applied on March 30th. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, spend the last couple, two, three slides here talking about some provisions from the um, from the second coronavirus bill, and this deals with paid sick leave. Um, and um, you know, we also have guides up on this. I know state and localities also have additional resources on this because there are interactions with the state and local programs and local uh, statutes that are in effect. So, um, so this was from the second bill. This was the Family First Act. Um, and this was, what it did is it, it created a requirement um, for employers with less than 500 employees to provide paid sick leave. And that's 10 days of paid sick leave. Um, and that's related to the coronavirus. So that can be, you know, if you do, you know, unfortunately contract coronavirus or if you're quarantined, if you're taking care of a family member that's quarantined, or if you're taking care uh, of a child because your daycare or school has closed. Uh, and this leave is paid at your regular weight but it's a maximum of $511 per day, unless you're taking care of a family member. Uh, then it drops down to two thirds of your regular rate uh, with a maximum of $200 per day. Uh, importantly here uh, on this, the federal government will reimburse the employer 100% of these costs. It's up to the daily maximum that um, you pay your employees. And this comes in the form of refundable tax credit. Um, and you know, with the understanding that obviously liquidity is the biggest issue here, the Treasury uh, Department is taking steps or has taken steps to allow businesses to request an advance on this. Um, so this is obviously in addition to what employers already provide and what uh, is pursuant to um, state and local law. Um, so there has been some talk about uh, businesses with fewer than 50 folks being exempt. Um, so the law does provide that an employer may be exempt, um, but they can only be exempt um, with respect to leave uh, that is tied uh, to providing care for a child whose daycare or school is closed and only to the extent um, if uh, that leave threatens the viability of the business. So if you think of it, if you think this applies to you, uh, certainly check out the Department of Labor's guidelines uh, on their website for further information. Um, and then finally, uh, paid sick leave is generally not available uh, if an employee is eligible to telework. Um, that only applies if the employee is taking care of, for example, a child um, so they can telework and then you stagger uh, or change the hours to make 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 the pieces of those puzzle work. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, okay, so paid FMLA leave, also from the second coronavirus bill, uh, Family Medical Leave Act. Um, so generally, FMLA, <coughs> pardon me, is a law that uh, allows for 12 weeks of unpaid leave. Uh, and what the what the second uh, coronavirus bill did said that uh, so employers with less than 500 employees are required um, to provide an additional 10 weeks uh, of paid family leave uh, if they need to take care of a, a child because of school or daycare closed um, once again. That's the only reason for the extended leave. So when you think about the interaction between this uh, and the sick leave that we just talked about, uh, an employee uh, would take 10, 10 days of paid sick leave first and then would be eligible um, for the 10 weeks. Um, here again, leave is at two thirds of the regular rate, maximum $200 per day. $10,000 uh, in the aggregate. And this is once again, in addition to what is already provided uh, under state uh, and federal and local law. Um, again, this is uh, reimbursed the same way by the federal government. Um, and once again, doesn't apply to folks uh, if employees can telework. Uh, and then last slide, get more information. I, I've mentioned both of our websites um, already. Um, but you know, like I said, this is, this is happening at a pretty fast clip. Um, so there's always new guidance. There's always new issues being worked out. Um, so talk it through obviously with whomever you can, we're always happy to answer questions. I got these two down that I need to take back today. So, um, maybe I'll stop there uh, and we'll take some, uh, take some additional questions. Okay. We do have another question. And, uh, this question is, are you aware of any assistance programs aimed at mom 
and pop landlords who do not qualify uh, and in parentheses no w-2 no ic pay but who are having to carry expenses but who have tenants who need and demand relief Ooh, i am not but i'm gonna i'll get an answer on that i'll see i haven't run into that question before okay i have to ask someone on that i don't want to give you bad advice on that scott right. Okay. Um, don't see any other questions unless we have some more coming up. Let's see. I mean, listen. There, like I said, there's going to be additional questions that come up. Right. You know, I, and I'm, I'm, of, I'm of course happy to field those. Um, you know, Congress is already talking about what they want to do uh, for the next program. Um, right. So I think that there is going to be obviously a replenishment of these funds, but Congress, you know, is already looking um, at what they can do for the next round. Right. And really what they want to see is, you know, how does this, stick? Uh, how does this phase three work? How is it implemented? What's the burn rate on, on the funds that are available? Who's using what? What's the interaction? Uh, and then they'll and then they'll move to legislate. Um, you know, Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi was talking about possibly bringing folks back in at the end of this month to take a look at a phase four bill. Um, there's no necessarily agreement right now on what that looks like. Uh, we saw more agreement when they were working on this current phase three bill, the one that's now law, the CARES Act we just talked about. Um, so yeah, more details coming on that. Uh, but yeah, obviously it's a learning process for everyone. How about Chris? I mean, I know that, um, you know, there's, there's not a whole lot of information coming out on limited lab or LLCs and, yeah. Uh, independent proprietor, you know, independent contractors, sole proprietors. So uh, we've there's been some information that it's coming soon. Is there? Do you have any? I don't have any right now, right? Because that the part that at least the Paycheck Protection Program, I believe that comes online this Friday um, for okay. those folks. So I would expect additional guidance coming out on that. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, gosh, you know that there is a lot of information coming out and it is changing every day, but I hope that everybody uh, was able to um, get some good information here and get some of your questions answered. I know there, there are a few that we will be getting back with you that Chris will look into. Um, I, I do hope that you found this informative and just know, you know, utilize those relationships you have when you have um, with your your CPAs with your banks, because there are great resources for you too to help you navigate through the different programs that are offered right now. Um, I wanna thank everybody for, for being here today. And I'm gonna see if at Darby, are there any closing remarks or anything that you would like to share? Sorry, I was needing to get unmuted there. Um, I just wanna thank everybody for joining us um, again encourage your peers to stay up to date with our calendar um, on Facebook and on our website because we will be continuing uh, to host more of these type of um, events because this is ever changing. Um, so we will, we will stay on top of it for you and keep offering these uh, formats. So please just keep up to date with our calendar. And thanks again for being a part of today. Thank you, Chris. Thanks everyone, I appreciate it. We'll come back and do this as many times as we need to. Um, certainly appreciate everything you're doing for the community, supporting your local restaurants. That's great to hear. Um, there's a reason I'm doing the video conference from, you know, the shoulders up is because I've been supporting my local uh, takeout as well. Uh, <laughs> but seriously, please, please uh, hit us up with any questions. Happy to answer it. Keep checking our website because, like I said, we're trying to produce as much guidance as we can in a short amount of time. Yes, you all have been a great resource to us to be able to push out to our community. We have about 725 members, uh, member businesses that represents about 10,000 employees in our community. So um, your resources have been great for that. So. I I applaud you for that. Thank you. Appreciate it. Guys. Thank you so much. Thank Stay you all. Good. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Bye bye. Bye. Well, thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you Thanks. very much. Thank you, Eva. Yeah.
think it was good. Good questions. Oh, um, yeah. yeah, well, good questions. Yeah, for sure. There's, it's like so many things are answered. But there's still so much unknown. Mm -hmm. Like, I, mean, I like two pages of notes, and then I'm sitting here like, well, can only call like half my people back. <laughs> right. Yeah. So. Well, hopefully, we'll get to hear from Chris, um, and then we can push those uh, answers out to the those that ask. So, for sure. Yes. Well, for sure. continue doing what y'all are doing. You're doing an amazing job supporting your local business, your local restaurants, and uh, and the and the city. So thank you. As a rock star. Thank you. All righty. Bye. Bye. All right. Bye, Eva. Hey, uh, right, Anderson. Can you just upload? Yeah. Can you upload that recording to um, what you call it to the M drive and just tell me where it's at, and I'll get that.